In this second mini lecture on tissue culture, we're going to talk about the specific stages that a plant goes through using this type of propagation. So there are four major stages. The first one is establishment. Now the thing that distinguishes these stages and that I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through them is, one, what forms during that stage, and two, what is in the media at that stage. During the established stage, typically there are no growth regulators, that is no plant hormones in the media. So you don't have auxin and cytokinin, you just have an agar media or a liquid media that contains minerals and nutrients and sugar and vitamins, but no growth regulators. And during this time, your original plant material, which by the way is called the X plant, whatever type of plant material that you put into tissue culture, that is called an X plant. So if I put five small pieces of leaf tissue into a jar for tissue culture, I've placed five X plants into that jar. So during establishment, you have your X plants in the jar, whether it be a leaf piece or a root piece or whatever it is, and small branch plantlets will begin to form from each X plant. Now in the second stage, the second stage is called multiplication, and during this stage, what you do you take the plantlets that have formed during establishment, cut them apart into individual shoots, and you place them on a new media. That media is going to have a high cytokinin to auxin ratio. It's going to contain both cytokinin and auxin usually, although not always. And it's just going to have more cytokinin than auxin because this is the time during which the shoots multiply. We want to get a lot of shoots on our plants during this stage. And that's what you see in the picture here. The sort of light brown gloppy bit in the background, that is the original X plant, probably a piece of leaf tissue in this case. And then arising off of it are many sort of spindly whitish yellow shoots. So this would be the establishment phase. We would cut each one of those off and you can see how they kind of look like a stem with two little leaves forming at the tip or at the apex of that spindly type thing. So that's a shoot. So what we would do once those form in the establishment phase, we would use our scalpel to cut those off and put a couple shoots into each jar and then they would multiply to produce even more shoots in the multiplication phase because again, it's on a media with high cytokinin at that time. Now during multiplication, these shoots can either form adventitiously or axillarily. If you have an axillary formation of a shoot in tissue culture, this basically means that a small bud forms completely in the tissue culture environment, then that bud breaks just like it would on a stem on a plant outside and grows a new shoot from that. Now, axillary shoot production in tissue culture is slower than adventitious, but the nice thing about it is they tend to be more uniform. Because an actual bud is formed, the shoot coming from that bud will be genetically identical to the parent plant. Adventitious shoot formation, however, happens a lot more quickly. No actual bud is formed, a shoot just forms straight off of your leaf piece or your root piece or whatever type of X plant you have in there. So it directly forms a shoot, it happens much more quickly, which is a good thing, but they can be less uniform. Sometimes they're forming from just one of those histogenic layers, if you'll recall those from the Freaks and Mutant lectures. And so if you have a chimera here, if you have some kind of mutation and you have a shoot that only arose from the mutated layer, well, that means that shoot's going to be a little different from your parent plant. The next two stages are pre-transplant and transplantation. So during the pre-transplant stage, Again, we've had all these shoots multiply in the multiplication phase, and so now we're going to, again, cut those out, separate them into various jars, so now we have a lot more jars of shoots, and the media in the pre-transplant phase or stage is going to have high auxin, low cytokinin. So for multiplication, we're trying to get more shoots, we have a high cytokinin to auxin ratio, for the pre-transplant phase, we're trying to get roots, not shoots, so we have a high auxin to cytokinin. More auxin in the pre-transplant phase, more cytokinin in the multiplication phase. So basically, in pre-transplant, roots form on those shoots. It begins to look 
more like an actual plant as you see in the picture here. And then the final stage is transplantation and acclimatization. This is the stage in which we actually remove our plant from tissue culture because we're not trying to grow it in a jar forever, right? During this stage, the plant is very vulnerable if you have to be very careful with it because basically up until this stage, it's been growing in the perfect environment. It doesn't really have to photosynthesize because there's already sugar in the media, there's no water stress, there's just nothing that it has to adapt to. When you remove it from that environment, you have to treat it very carefully or it will die. So during this last stage, when we move our plant out of the jar, out of the agar to a more regular scenario, usually in a greenhouse, we have to keep the plant in high humidity. A lot of times plants that we take out of tissue culture, we put them under intermittent mist for a few weeks so they can get used to the moisture change and water stress. You wanna use a loose, well-drained media that agar gel it's been growing on is really easy to grow in so the roots aren't very strong, which is why it's important to have a very loose media that you can carefully transplant this into. And then you need to protect it from pathogens because again, this was growing in a completely sterile environment and you just took it out, so it's very vulnerable. Again, the best way to do this is to complete this phase in a greenhouse, not straight into the outdoors. There are actually anatomical and physiological reasons why your tissue culture plants are so delicate during this last stage, the acclimatization stage. The first is that they have less cuticle. Cuticle, if you'll remember back to your plant anatomy lecture, is just a waxy coating over the leaves and what it does is it reduces water loss from the leaf by transpiration. Well, because plants grown in micropropagation don't have any water stress because they're in a controlled jar where there's never not enough humidity um, or never any water stress. The plant just hasn't had to form cuticle. It hasn't needed to adapt to that. So when you take it out, it just doesn't have it. Another thing is the stomata, which you remember are those pores that open and close to let water vapor in and out. They are essentially what controls transpiration. They're non-functional in a tissue cultured plant. I begin, because there's never been any water stress on that plant, the stomata on a plant grown in micropropagation are stuck on always open. There's nothing regulating transpiration because until you took it out of the jar, it just had no need to. Well, they will begin to function, but it takes a few weeks, so you need to put it again in a high humidity environment until it, for lack of a better word, learns how to open and close its stomata instead of leaving them open all the time. That micropropagated plant has never really had to photosynthesize. It may a little bit just from being in the light, but there's sugar in the media, so it hasn't had to photosynthesize to make its own sugar much. And as such, it has a low carbon fixation potential, which just means it's not photosynthesizing at a very high efficiency. So it has to adapt to that. And then finally, the roots of a micropropagated plant are often very brittle and without root hairs. They have been growing in a very soft gel-like substance, which is why they're brittle. And the root hairs are what take up most of the water for a plant, which again, has just not been necessary in this perfect environment. So those are some anatomical and physiological reasons why a plant that's been micropropagated is going to need to be treated gently until it acclimatizes to its new environment. All right, so remember I told you guys that micropropagation is the word we usually use when we're doing this solely to propagate plants, but that sometimes we use it for other reasons. When we use it for other reasons, that's when we start to call this process tissue culture usually, and so I wanna talk about some of these other applications for tissue culture here. So in these situations, plants are still being propagated, but that's not the sole goal of what we're doing. An orchid seed is our first example. You cannot grow orchid from seed just normally. You can't sow some orchid seed in a pot and watch it grow because orchid seeds have no stored food reserves. They have nothing to power the whole germination process. The way they germinate in nature is that they have this symbiotic relationship with a fungi that provides nutrients and food for the seed. It provides those food reserves that the orchid seed needs to germinate. However, we don't have any way to get that fungi if we're growing orchid seed ourselves, and so the answer 
is to grow orchids from seed and tissue culture because here the tissue culture medium is going to take the place of fungi because it contains the sugars and the nutrients that those seeds need to germinate. Now you're thinking, why even bother, maybe? Well, if you're breeding new orchid cultivars, the only way you can see what you got from the cross you made is to grow it from seed. If you use a vegetative piece, you aren't sexually propagating or breeding any kind of new plant. So if you're breeding new orchids, you want to see what they look like, what the result of your cross is. You have to tissue culture those seeds and grow up the offspring to see what they turn out to be like. Orchid seeds are very small, by the way. Every tiny little green dot in that gel there is an orchid seed that's been starting to grow. Another application is chimera resolution. Now remember that plants have three histogenic layers in the meristem. That's three regions from which new growth comes, and those three regions become different parts of the plant. Remember, L1 becomes that outer epidermal layer of the leaves, for example. Remember also that I said that in the multiplication stage of tissue culture, we sometimes get adventitious shoots forming. Instead of forming a bud and breaking from that bud, they form from callus cells and they form from basically just whatever type of cells your explant originally were. So for adventitious multiplication, if I get a new shoot that rises up from a cell that is in the L1 layer and we have some kind of mutation in the L1 layer, well that new shoot, if I grow it on, will now have the mutation in all three of its histogenic layers. So to say it another way, we have callus cell rising from all three of the original parent plant histogenic layers. If one of those callus cells arises from a mutated layer and we grow a new plant from that mutated cell, the new plant will have the mutation in all its cells and all its layers. Now this is a good thing. What you see happening in the picture here, this is a plant that typically has red leaves, but the L1 layer has the red mutation and the L2 layer is unmutated, making that green tissue. So the green tissue typically is masked by the red tissue in the parent plant, but here in tissue culture, because we have shoots arising from cells in different layers, some of those are completely green and some of them are completely red. Another really useful application of this is thornless blackberries and other brambles. Remember that our brambles can easily be propagated by root cuttings, but if they are a chimera, if they're thornless and I propagate it by a root cutting, that thornless trait won't get passed on. Well, what if we could make a thornless blackberry that wasn't a chimera? Instead of having just that thornless mutation in the L1 layer, what if we could make it so the thornless mutation was in all three layers? Well then, I could have a thornless blackberry that could also still be propagated by root cuttings, which is a lot easier than tissue culture at the end of the day. Well, that's what they did. There's a cultivar of blackberry called Leek and Logan. It is a thornless blackberry and it is not a chimera. They developed it to have the thornless mutation in all three histogenic layers by using chimera resolution in tissue culture. And then finally, we often use, and I've mentioned this before in the Freaks and Mutants lecture, but we often use tissue culture to induce mutation. Again, if we have adventitious multiplication happening in tissue culture, that means we could have shoots arising from mutated layers on their own, which means we have more mutated plants, like more thornless blackberries. So sometimes just the act of growing a plant in tissue culture or micropropagating it will cause more mutated individuals to appear. However, to take it even farther, you can apply certain treatments to your tissue cultured plants to induce mutation. And we've discussed that this is often done by radiating the plants or applying a chemical mutagen. Now, both radiation and chemical mutagens are nasty things that we want to come in as little contact with as we possibly can. Chemical mutagens may mutate you too. In any case, if you get them on you, it's not going to do anything good to you. And of course, the same with radiation. It's much safer to apply these mutation-inducing treatments to small explants in a petri dish or a jar than it is to a large plant growing in a nursery pot. So this is how we do it, and this is what I did for part of my research. I grew some plants in tissue culture, 
I sent my petri dishes to the nuclear reactor on campus. They exposed them to radiation for me. I also exposed some to chemical mutagens, but it's a much smaller area, much smaller plant pieces to work with, so it's just a lot safer. And that's how this plant was produced. This is a pineapple that you see in the picture, and there's a pineapple breeding program going on in Hawaii, of course. They're trying to produce pineapples that not only taste good, but are also ornamental. So here they have a variegated one with variegated leaves. They've also bred it to not have teeth. Pineapples typically have very sharp teeth or spines along those leaf edges, so you could see that's not the most desirable trait. And so the way they've achieved this thornless variegated pineapple is by just such means as I've discussed. They grew it in tissue culture, they applied treatments to it to induce mutations, they grew those plants on, and they were able to get from that an individual that had the traits they wanted, such as this one. One last application, and this is very similar to inducing mutation because it's just inducing a specific type of mutation, but in tissue culture it's also very easy to create polyploids. Now you may remember a polyploid is just a plant that has extra sets of genetic code. So instead of having, for example, two sets of all the chromosomes, it would have four sets of all the chromosomes. So it has extra genetic material. You can, again, create a polyploid just by applying a certain chemical to that plant, but it's a rather nasty chemical, which is why it's much easier for us to do it in tissue culture than on a large potted plant. The reason why we like to make these polyploids, it's not just because we want more chromosomes. By doing that, usually you get a plant with enhanced vigor, larger, longer lasting flowers, and thicker leaves, among other characteristics. So for example, what you see pictured here is a rhododendron. It's a cultivar called Nova Zembla. It's pretty attractive. But when they induced a polyploid version of this plant in tissue culture, they ended up with this. This is rhododendron supernova. That's the name of that cultivar. The only difference between the two is supernova is a polyploid, Nova Zembla is not. So by inducing polyploidy in Nova Zembla, they got supernova, which you can see has larger flowers, more flowers, it's just a more vigorous plant. So again, all of these are just other applications of tissue culture other than just straight propagation. So you're probably thinking, that's pretty cool, how can I do it at home? Well. This is probably the worst type of plant propagation to do at home, mainly for the reason of it, you have to have a sterile environment and that's very difficult to do at home without special equipment. However, there are people that do it. I have not dabbled in this yet because I have access to tissue culture labs on campus and I don't have time to try it at home, but you might. And I have tried what you see in the two bottom pictures here. These are products that you can buy. You can actually buy them on Amazon.com, and they're essentially little tissue culture sets. The one on the left, the tube with the blue gel, and of course this media just has the same thing that all media has in it, agar, nutrients, sugar, etc. But they also added a little food coloring for you to make it look cooler. So basically they give you these sealed up vials, you open it quickly and throw your seeds in there so that they'll start growing. So this is sexual tissue culture since we're using seeds as our explants. And then they grow in the gel and you can transplant them out of it at some point. You have to be very careful when you insert those seeds and keep it as much unexposed there as possible so it doesn't get contaminated. But it's an easy home tissue culture set. Now you can do your own tissue culture, make your own media, use a pressure cooker to sterilize or the microwave perhaps, although I don't think the microwave is gonna do it just on its own. And there's actually a whole home tissue culture group and society out there with lots of advice about how to make a rough and ready laminar float hood at home and how to tissue culture plants at home. So. I'm going to post several links about that for you. Make sure you look at those on the Moodle page. But it's certainly be a fun thing to try. Probably going to take several tries before you're successful. But if it's something that interests you, by all means, give it a whirl.